So Nicholas Bornos of Capital India would like to welcome you to the last, but definitely not the least of uh, the panels of uh, our opening day of the New York Maritime Forum. So we're concluding uh, our first day with a great panel on, on a very innovative topic. It's expanding the research and investor universe for sure. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Robert Bugby, who uh, has been very helpful uh, putting this panel together and uh, for developing this idea how we can discuss about exactly new people who have entered the research and trading uh, space and how their presence is helping expand the investor universe, of course, alongside the traditional coverage by the uh, mainstream analysts. So thank you, Jay, Omar, and uh, Calvin, and I will turn it over to Robert. And again, tremendous thanks for your uh, participation. Great. Thank you. thank you very much, Nicholas. Uh, thank you, Calvin, Jay, Omar. You know, I, I put you guys together because, uh, you know, I, I know that all three of you every day are watching the shipping markets and you you analyze it and you really put yourself out there on a daily basis in terms of your recommendations and you you know you create um you know data and you and you're accessible in one form or another to to people who aren't necessarily running big funds etc one of the things that i've noticed is that we're getting a lot more interest from smaller family funds or from um, private individuals who are actually putting, you know, quite real money on the line, and it's their money, not other people's money, and it's hard with the new regulations for them to always get access to the publishing analysts, etc., or basic market information. And I think that all three of you, in in one way or another, in different ways, provide and help that access and education to the market. So that's really why. You know, putting you three together, and I think that, and then you, all three of you, are opinionated. So I'd like to sort of just sort of start sort of quickly. Um, I'd like to start with, uh, with with Jay actually. Um, you know, just to open up by sort of telling us sort of what kind of interests you now, or what's been interesting you. You know, what what's your sort of uh, excited about right now in relation to prospective shipping investments, etc. Yeah, thank you, Robert, for that great introduction. Uh, thanks to Capital Inc. Uh, for putting this together. It's a very formidable three-day agenda. It's been a lot of interesting panels. Um, also great to be here with, with Calvin and Omar today. Yeah, I, I've been in shipping for 10 years and, and running Value Investors Edge now for six years. And it, this is just a very interesting time. Shipping's always interesting. But this is such an interesting time because rates are very good. Cash flows are very good. Balance sheets are very clean. Everything's going right for many of these companies, not all segments, right? Uh, but in container ships and dry bulk, things are going very, very well. But it seems like nobody wants to buy these companies. Uh, the valuations, the multiples keep getting lower and lower. Uh, so we're really interested. Uh, it's not real original at this moment, but we're actually still interested in the, uh, the liners like Zim Integrated. We bought back into those recently after the big pullback. I like a lot of uh, box lessors, container ship lessors. Uh, the safer stuff we're getting into, uh, or at least I consider it safer on a risk reward basis, is the box lessors. They're the companies that own the actual 40 foot you know, metal containers. And two of those are uh, Textainer and Triton. Uh, we just put out a research report for our members uh, covering those. So I guess I'd say on the exciting side, on the trading side, we like Zim, a lot Zim integrated ZIM. And I'm long in trading that personally after disclose that. And then we like uh, Textainer and Triton on the more conservative side. Robert, you're on mute. Thank you very much, Omar. Calvin, please, if you'd like to go next. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this panel. It's uh, definitely an honor to be here and to share it with uh, such accomplished guys. Um, as far as what I do and wh where I think the, the big opportunities are, so I've got, I've got a website where and a Discord chat where I sell information about uh, the tanker companies primarily now and soon to be the, the rest of them. And we talk about, you know, what's going on in the market, what oil inventories are doing, um, you know, where orders are going, uh, storms, sanctions, et cetera. All, you know, all the all the little things that, that impact uh, shipping markets. 
And I've mainly been focused on, on tankers. So where I think the, the big opportunity is, when I look out at the, uh, the software landscape, the, and the maritime landscape, you've kind of got uh, a lot of companies that are focused on um, you know, giving information to uh, investors, especially institutional investors, but they're not really built for shipping. Okay, so yeah, Bloomberg would be you know, kind of the high end, uh, Seeking Alpha would be you know, kind of the, maybe the lower end, um, other, a ton of data vendors, uh, one thing that I noticed is that it's, it's extremely hard to, uh, to get accurate, even quarterly financial data for a lot of these companies. Um, you know, the ADRs, for example, and um, the, uh, the foreign filers, uh, you know, they don't have uh, a lot of the same SEC requirements. So, you know, things aren't in the same format. Things don't go out at the same clip. Um, and then uh, you have on the other side, a lot of maritime software providers that focus on selling data, uh, selling information to charterers and companies, to, uh, essentially to help them with their chartering operations saying, you know, okay, well, you know, here's, here's how many cargoes are here. Here's how many cargoes are loaded. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is what uh, congestion looks like. And, and so then, you know, charters and uh, uh, owners can use that in their negotiations to decide whether they want to, uh, to push or, uh, or give and, and take the deal that they can get. So I think that there's a really interesting opportunity to kind of, uh, you know, land somewhere in between where you take a lot of the intelligence that the charters and the owners use to make their day-to-day -day business decisions. Um, and those are really the things that kind of determine where the, uh, where the market's going to go, where rates, where rates are going to go. And you combine that with uh, the, you know, the stuff that's traditionally been focused on investors. So, you, you know, you've got all the quarterly financials, you've got companies, you know, kind of side by side in an apples to apple comparison so that you can actually see, um, you know, the same metric in the same way uh, as it applies to uh, different companies. I, I think this is a sector that's just not very understood. So, uh, you know, giving investors the ability to look at this industry from the perspective of not only an investor, but also like a charterer or an owner um, to understand better the dynamics that, that drive the, where the market goes in the short term, medium term, long term. Um, I, I think there, there's, a, there's a big opportunity there and, and you would probably, uh, if people understood shipping, you know, you, maybe you'd get better multiples sooner. Um, you know, it's just, uh, these, are, these are cyclicals. Cyclicals are always hard to analyze. And, and uh, I think uh, uh, shipping's, you know, maybe especially hard for people to, to understand because the booms and busts are just so spectacular. So somebody got burned 10 years ago and, you know, now they're, they're terrified of shipping. Um, you know, somebody, uh, uh, you know, made 6X, 10X, 20X on a shipping company and now they think nothing can go wrong in shipping. It's kind of, kind of both ends of it. So I think landing somewhere in the middle where you can give people the financial intelligence that they get from somewhere like Bloomberg and then the market intelligence that they get from somewhere like Clarkson's, um, that's, that's really the, uh, the sweet spot, figuring out how to combine those so that, uh, that people can understand both sides of it. Great. Omar? Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Robert. And uh, yeah, very, very happy to be a part of this panel. And, and Robert, thanks for putting it together with, uh, and, and getting me here with, with Jay and Calvin. I've gotten to know Jay here over the past several years, um, and it's just it's it's nice to see and, and Calvin, nice to meet you here today. Uh, it's just nice to see people in similar walks of life uh, looking at shipping. Uh, I think, generally speaking, we're we're pretty excited uh, just that Clarkson's about the the market outlook really across the board for shipping, and it just shows really uh, for the past ten to twelve years a true lack of investment and what that means for for the sector as a whole. And you throw in all the regulatory aspects and, and everything. It just it seems that we are at the beginnings of a nice uh, sustained uh, up cycle. And uh, you know, obviously, liners and container shipping have really captured a lot of the, the headlines. Dry bulk has done very well. Um, LNG recently, LPG really for the past year. Uh, chemicals are showing signs of improvement, and you've got tankers that are starting to to, to come uh, to come out. But I think what what's very interesting and and really Jay and Calvin, one of the unique things about shipping is, is it's not just, it, it's funny, the, the audience tends to be quite small and you have a lot of people who traffic in and out throughout the cycles. But it feels to me that shipping in my career, having gone back to the early 2000s, it just seems to be at the, at the forefront of everything topical uh, from an economic standpoint. Uh, whether you've had, 
you know, the, the, the trade war between China and, and the U.S. or the oil price war between uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia. Um, and then more recently with container port disruptions and uh, the impact on retailers and having to, to build inventory ahead of the holiday season. Uh, and, and then obviously the energy crisis that's going on that initially started in Europe. And now it seems to be showing really uh, in Asia and how is shipping uh, uh, playing into that. We have a real inside look by, our, by virtue of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is just seeing a lot of these trends developing. And so a lot of the conversations that I end up having with, with people is, yeah, I may be talking to an investor who's looking to make an investment in a, in a shipping company, but a lot of times I'm also talking to a, a big box retail uh, um, analyst or, or, or an investor who's looking at uh, um, other layers of the energy chain trying to get a grasp on what's actually happening. And so we can use a lot of the data that we track on a regular basis to help them formulate a decision on whether a shoe manufacturer is going to be able to get all their materials in time uh, to meet the, the Christmas season. Um, and so it's, a, it's that type of thing that I find very, very interesting and in, in, uh, in, in changes on a regular basis. Great. So I just want to ask you a couple of sort of sectors here. So, um, and, and everyone come in. I mean, Jay, the, 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 the obvious sort of, let's say, comeback that people sort of seem to give now on the containers to, you know, the bull thesis is, look, and we even heard it today on a panel, and, and that counts for the dry too, is that containers on dry benefited so much from the consumer buying goods as opposed to going out and flying or going on holidays or going to restaurants or theaters, et cetera, like that. And, you know, they've benefited from congestion, both dry and containers. So, you know, as the world's opening up and, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, how, how would you comment to that? Yeah, no, I think that is kind of the logical concern or, or skepticism about the sector. Um, one of the things that attracts us to containers, even at this point, and, and I've been very long and, and bullish consistently on this for about 13 months now, so I didn't just, you know, trip stumble into it. But uh, the reason I'm still long them now is, is mostly due to the valuations. Because when I look at containers, it, it's a different segment than tankers and bulkers. And I know, Robert, you know that better than anybody. But uh, bulkers and, and, and tankers historically have traded very close with, with spot rates, with FFAs, a combination of those, a combination of the rates. Lesser businesses in the past have been much more about a net present value of charter backlog. That's always how they've been traded until very recently. Now, recently, folks are getting skeptical. They're saying, hey, rates are at all-time highs. What happens when those rates crest and they turn down? And, and we actually think rates are going to crest any day now. In fact, we might actually be at the peak rates right now. They might even come down next month. But when we look at a company like just listing one of them that were long global ship lease, a GSL, uh, we value them based on a net present value of cash flows. We look at the residual charters they've signed for three, four, five years. We model in what happens if they have to take that ship back at the end of the charter and demolish it and so forth. And when we look back historically at companies like uh, C-SPAN, which is Atlas Corp now, companies like Costa Marae, companies like Denals Corp, uh, they've always been valued that way. And in fact, if you look at when rates crashed, the last two times rates peaked and then crashed uh, was 2005, 2006. The rates crashed, not crashed, but they came down about 50% into 2007, 2008. It was still a strong market, but the rates came down, right? And that's kind of the scenario we expect to happen in 2022 and 23. We expect it to be a good, healthy market. We expect rates to come down. Last time that happened, all those stocks almost tripled over that time frame as those cash flows were realized as companies understood that yes, the rates are coming down, but the earnings are still actually going up. The second time rates came down was in about 2011 to 2014. Rates came down a lot and it was a weak market. So it was like the worst of the worst. The rates came down and the market kind of sucked. Both Costa Marae and C-SPAN basically doubled over that time in total return. Uh, so when I look at these things, and I look at the valuations, I'm very comfortable. Now, if Global Ship Lease is 50 bucks and the Nows Corp is 130, 140, um, then no, I'm probably not long the companies. So it's all about the valuations for me in, in that segment. That's great. I think it's fantastic as a comment that, you know, shipping can possibly one of the only industries that something could crash, its revenue could crash 50%. And yes, the stocks go, you know, continue to go upwards because the remaining earnings are so good. So if we move now to, to let's say to, to Calvin, I mean, you must be sort of... Um, 
you know, waiting on tender hooks if you're following the tankers here. I mean, you know, well, what what do you think is, what are you saying to your guys? What's your thesis? You know, where are we on the tankers at the moment? Well, you know, we're looking at uh, jet fuels, jet fuel on a monthly basis, weekly basis, loadings. Um, you know, we're looking at the age of the fleet. Um, you know, with, with tankers, I, I think it just comes down to, uh, you know, when are we going to start seeing the same kind of tightness that we've seen in other shipping sectors because people are, are you know, kind of short on, on, in, on their own inventories and they need to restock. So uh, in the last tanker panel, they were talking about Chinese inventories been, being kind of transparent. But, you know, if we look at, you know, a lot of other uh, global inventories, U.S. inventories, for example, um, you know, we're at five-year lows on inventories. And if, if I'm not mistaken, that's sort of what drove a lot of the, uh, uh, the container congestion as well as, you know, uh, all these retailers couldn't get shipments and uh, their warehouses started kind of getting empty, store shelves started getting empty. So, you know, they needed to replenish now. And uh, so I, I think, you know, keeping a close eye on, on inventories is, uh, is pretty important. Um, the other thing to think about is, uh, is asset values. So uh, Jay was talking about, you know, valuing uh, container companies on net present value of, uh, of cash flow. Um, I've heard other people talk about how, you know, container companies are trading below NAV. And I, and I think, well, yeah, but the asset values come up, you know, 6x, 10x, right, in a, in a couple of years. So um, if, uh, if the picture changes as far as what the, you know, what uh, companies can get on uh, asset purchases, asset prices are going to come down. Uh, just as an example, looking at deals from the last week, you know, you've got a bunch of uh, containers that went on charter for two years to three years, and they went on charter at pretty healthy rates. Um, you, you are seeing very few deals done that extend past 2023, 2024, um, or well, past 2024. The one there, uh, there was a couple uh, new times shipbuilding new orders uh, that are going on charter immediately after being delivered. They're getting delivered and then going on charter for 40k a day for eight years. That's a 7k TEU ship. That's like a third of current spot rates. So um, you know, cash flows are great now, and anybody that's locking these in for duration, you, I mean, that's fantastic, obviously. Um, but things are definitely going to hit a wall in a couple of years, especially with you know the the, the big order books. Um, anybody that's locking that in, I, I totally agree with, uh, with Jay, you know, especially if they're actually going to return some of that cash through their, uh, through their dividend policies and not just, you know, get bigger and bigger fleets. Um, you know, it would really worry me if somebody was kind of, you know, buying a huge fleet at the top of the market where assets are being valued based on current cash flows. And then we see in, you know, three years, those charter rates are down 60, 70%. And they bought based on evaluation today, um, but with uh, with tankers, you know, we're kind of in uh, a uh, uh, maybe not a trough valuation anymore. But stocks are still cheap. You know, we're looking at 50, 60, 70 percent of NAV, and uh, you know, asset values really aren't uh, aren't that far off of uh, off of trough valuations, especially considering where the steel price is at. Um, so you know, anything could happen with the steel price. Uh, you know, we were looking uh, just recently at, uh, you know, how steel demand breaks down in the iron ore trade. You know, if China's property, bubble, if they stop building cities, um, that's going to that's going to be a huge hit to uh, to steel demand. Um, China makes up like half of all steel consumption, half of all steel production, and their real estate sector is like 40 percent of their total uh, steel usage. Right. So. If, uh, you know, you saw Evergrande, Fantasia, a couple of these other guys um, going under, you know, you, know, you know, not paying their bonds, their dollar denominated bonds. So if, if something fundamentally changes uh, economically in China around, you know, how they manage their economy, it's going to have a huge effect on iron and coal, um, especially with, you know, I mean, right now, <laughs> everybody was right. The ESG people, you know, got the whole uh, we need to decarbonize now thing uh, 
you know, maybe they didn't plan for the how do we keep our factories running in the meantime thing. Um, but if, if economic models change, especially in China, um, and they stop building mega cities, and for whatever reason, they stop, you know, refining so much steel, I think it's going to be pretty challenging for shipping. It's definitely going to bring steel values down. You know, a year ago, I was talking about steel values are going to go up, you know, like uh, the uh, all these pro infrastructure projects people are talking about, steel values are going to have to go up. Um, all, all shipping assets are going to ri rise in value. Uh, scrap prices are going to go up. And, uh, that, you know, that happened. But I, I think now with where we're at, you know, we're looking at the, the tanker market and, and saying, okay, well, volumes are going to have to start going up. Shipping volumes are going to have to start increasing or inventories are going to keep drawing. But I think we also need to look at what's going to happen in the steel market and ask whether or not China is changing its economic model. Uh, it's kind of a kind of a ramble, but uh, um, I'm, I'm worried. What do you what, we talk about every week? You could comment on tankers, dry, but it sounds like you know there's a sort of a pretty strong attack from Calvin on the potential of the dry bolt going forward. If you're going to hit steel and and I, I'm not attacking it. I'm not attacking it. I'm I'm just saying that nobody can deny that if if you've got you know the if the global dry bolt trade is 30% iron ore, 30% coal, right? And, you know, Chinese real estate demand is, uh, you know, 40% of all uh, steel demand in their domestic market, which uh, takes was just like 50% of global demand. I mean, it's pretty easy to do the math there, right? If, if China property building, you know, freezes for six months, you've got a double digit hit to the to uh, dry bulk volumes, right? Yeah, I, that's I, Omar? All right, good. Well, uh, Calvin, you touched on a bunch of items and, and, and Jay as well. I would love to follow up on, um, I guess, you're, you're, Calvin, I think that's a, it's a great point that you bring up about you know, China and how its economy is shifting. What's somewhat fascinating and probably what's taken everyone by surprise is pretty much as soon as the Chinese slowed down steel production is actually when capes sprung to life, uh, which is unheard of, right? We're, we're conditioned that China and dry bulk go together. What's good for China tends to be good for dry bulk, but what's bad for China tends to be very, very bad for dry bulk. Uh, but if you remember, first six months of the year, the Chinese steel output was up maybe 10%, uh, which is fine. It's easy comps. It's against last year's pandemic uh, levels, but you had steel production growth and, and capes were, were decent, but they were underperforming a lot of the other vessel classes in dry bulk. And then as soon as steel production started to decline, which has been, I think, down 10% um, year over year since July. Uh, capes have now shot up towards 80,000 a day. And I think that's what's surprised the market. Obviously steel values have moved higher or asset values have moved higher. The equities have moved higher. But one thing that may not have, that hasn't really come in a big way, which I think speaks to what you're talking about, Calvin, is the, uh, the time charter demand. We're, we're still seeing charters focusing still on spot cargoes three months, six months, and going out to a year where there's a lot of liquidity. Beyond that, they're, they're not yet ready to do that. And it's because of that uncertainty on China, which is uh, you know, obviously anyone's guess, but right now the, 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 the headlines are quite nerve wracking, I guess you could say on that. Uh, and obviously one of the biggest surprises has been thermal coal, which everyone assumed would be a bounce back this year off of last year, but to this degree where it's become a, a huge, huge cargo that's uh, resuscitated a lot of the Capes and the Panamax, Supermax trades um, you know, that, that's been the big, big surprise this year. So it'll be interesting to see how things develop here as we progress through the winter uh, for dry bulk. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention also on containers, Jay, you, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, and, and, and Robert, you had asked this, the, the conventional view had been um, uh, as soon as we all get vaccinated, we're, we're going to start traveling and using services more. And, what, and, and that I think, it, Jay, if you remember, you talked about Zim earlier, when they were doing their IPO, one of the biggest pushbacks earlier this year was, well, why am I going to buy now? Uh, we're just about to get vaccinated. And if that's the case, then shouldn't this whole container story end? But it's almost as if you know, once the U.S. especially got fully vaccinated, that's seemingly when we started buying a whole lot more and the, and the market got even more uh, congested. And we're at this point now where there's just a lot of uncertainty as to what is the next step for freight rates. Uh, clearly, they're at unsustainable highs. It's just not, it, it can't stay this high considering how much it actually costs a liner to move uh, a box for, for its customer. But what hasn't happened before is 
now they're starting to enter into three-year freight agreements that cover them for 22, 23, and into 24. And so that's the type of visibility that liners have never been able to capture. And with that visibility, they want ships and they want to take ships on long-term contracts and order vessels. And, um, and so it, it, it's interesting because if you look at the order book for containers, it's gone up from, it was, a, it, was a, it was exciting last year to say, hey, we've only got an 8% order book. Now it's up to 23% which historically isn't scary, but it's obviously a huge step up. But of that 23%, 20, to 20, 20 out of that 23% is, is, uh, is against long-term charters to a liner. Um, and so there's not much speculation in the new buildings, which is very different than what we've seen in the past. I'm so I just wanted to make those two points. I'm going to throw a couple of other things out there here. Is, is the you know, is this, can it be the case here to go back to what Jay was saying in terms of his, his experience of rates coming down and and but the actual stocks moving upwards, which is exactly what happened, is that in let's say the containers and the dry bulk, the rates are, you know, we got this sort of the rates are so high that there's a fear that 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 they have to fall, so therefore people hold back from buying because of that fear. So you, if the rates actually fall but remain because of the actual dynamics in the world at reasonable rates, that's when the share, where new investors come in because they're no longer afraid of the actual fall that they think is going to happen from the super high rates. And then in tankers, you know, it's kind of the opposite. The tankers are being held back at the moment because people are afraid to jump in until they see the rates improve. So, you know, traditionally we've seen things that, you know, the wonderful phrase that I was taught younger, you know, from a friend of ours, Arma, was, you know, there are more buyers higher. And that's what seems to happen in, in shipping. People just buy when the stocks start to move and chase that momentum. That's another thing I'd like to stick out there for comment. Then the third thing is the capital link phenomenon. This is for Nick, for, uh, Nick Nicholas himself, is that capital link has this incredible... Um, sort of um, record of firstly, when people think that a market is on fire, you know, that market can, we come back next year and that market is really crushed. And we have the wonderful times that the market that, that people are ignoring during the conference because it's not doing anything like that classic thing that the VLCC market a few years ago where someone got up and said, you know, tankers are to go into the abyss, never to come out again. Um, you know, the opposite happens. So for the next sort of talking points, Jay, if you'd like to take take this one first, um, you know, pick any of those comments or anything else you'd like to take. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of great comments there. And, and one, of, one of the things I notice uh, is sort of, I guess, the curse of, of shipping stocks or, or trading shipping stocks. When the rates are bad, uh, a lot of people don't want to touch them right? Like tankers right now. Some folks are getting in, but a lot of folks are scared to get into a market where the rates are bad. But when the rates are really good, nobody wants to buy because they're all worried the rates are going to crash tomorrow. And, and furthermore, a problem we have is, is the delayed results of reporting. So not only do shipping companies report later on average, Scorpio does a better job on average, but a lot of these companies report two months after the quarter. But you think about the rates you see on the screen, say it's February. You see that rate on the screen, well, that voyage might not even start until maybe April, that's Q2, right? And then it goes through Q2, but you don't even report Q2 until, you know, August, late August, end of August. So you got to wait from February when you see the rate on your screen until August when you actually see your earnings per share. And in this day and age, investors don't have that kind of attention span, especially in a cyclical industry where, you know, maybe the peak is, you know, maybe it was like the uh, tankers with Costco sanctions. Right, that was maybe what a four month trade, or it was like floating uh, oil storage, <laughs> floating tankers last year. That was what a two month trade, right? And, and, and by the time those results actually came out, everybody had already moved on. So you got to have something that lasts for six, eight, 10, 12 months. And that's, that's why container ships have been so great because it started moving last fall and it's been going for 13 months straight. And now we're finally starting to get the results coming out. And, and some of these stocks, I mean, uh, some of these are 10 baggers, 15 baggers. And that can happen in other sectors as well. 
but but we have to have have to have the runway <laughs> as far as the conferences uh, robert i haven't been around to as many as you have and, and probably omar as well but absolutely true uh, capital link marine money all of them uh, whenever there's no investors in the room whenever the sentiment is really bad uh, that's the time to start buying and i don't know the visitor counts on capital link i don't know if nicholas will disclose that but if the investor counts really high today i'm going to start getting a little nervous <laughs> thank you I can tell you, you're very well attended right now, uh, Jay. Lots of people just <laughs> Oh, man, sell, sell everything. <laughs> uh, uh, Calvin? No, there's still doubt. Uh, there's definite doubt because those dry cargo stocks sell down. The containers have sold down. You know, the, the natural gas stocks. I mean, you know, think of that, some of those LNG companies with rates are completely ripping and yet, that's that's phenomenon of oh my god you know maybe we can't buy this uh, yeah. you know one day one day Golar is going to have its day I'm telling you one day uh, well the, you know I think that that it's it's should be right to have its day with with gas I don't think it's it's hard to imagine a greater arbitrage than you know six to thirty four dollars right now so Calvin let's hear your comments your thoughts. Yeah, so yeah, I, it was, uh, I think, Matt McLeary's book in Shipping Man, you know, he was talking about how the, the, the Wall Street guys would all get in after they've seen, uh, you know, a couple good quarters. And that's when all the Greek guys are selling, right? Um, when uh, there's, a, you know, a string of good prints because, the, you know, the Wall Street guys are looking at the, you know, quarterly EPS. They're seeing that earnings trend, which, I mean, it is, a, you know, beautiful to look at, right? Um, but uh, the uh, you know the Greek ship owners they're they're uh, they're selling into that liquidity, and uh, then when uh, when you know you've had a a string of uh, bad prints or you know rates are falling and, and things look bad you know when everybody hates a certain uh, sector that's uh, that's definitely the time to buy. So you know last fall this time tankers were kind of in that area. Uh, Sting, I think, bottomed out at like $8. And people are saying, oh, yeah, it's, you know, it's bankrupt next month. I mean, it's a stupid comment, but that's the kind of thing that, you know, that people believe because that's when people get pessimistic, you know, they, they just kind of only see, uh, only see red. And uh, so I think that anytime that you've got a cyclical industry that everybody hates, you better be buying because things are going to change. Um, you know, just think back two years ago, um, Jay mentioned Costco sanctions and uh, the uh, uh, floating storage trade, uh, you know, IMO 2020. Um, I mean, it seemed like a couple years ago that we were looking at a really strong cyclical improvement in, uh, in tankers. You know, uh, uh, Cleves kept using the word super cycle over and over. Um, and then COVID happened. And everything changed and that got pushed back. So you really, you never know what's going to happen in the world. You know, we all have, a, we all have opinions and people say, oh yeah, the FFAs are, you know, are at this level. So that means that, you know, this is going to happen in the next three months or so. Um, but that's really just, uh, you know, a kind of a set of people's opinions, um, brokers, charters, uh, um, owners, uh, trading houses, that they're kind of playing on their hopes and fears, right? The, uh, the owners are hoping that rates are going to go higher. The charters are hedging against that, um, <laughs> right? Uh, in, in dry bulk, it's kind of, kind of the opposite. The charters are hoping that the, the rates are going to go lower. The owners are, are hedging against that. You know, people want to uh, people want to do uh, longer charter deals. Um, but the, my point is just that we don't know how the world's going to change again in the next three months, the next six months, or the next year. Nobody could have predicted in January uh, on January first of uh, of twenty twenty. Um, you know, I mean, I remember looking at how much my tanker stocks were up in January, early January twenty twenty, and then all of a sudden, Goldman says that there's a virus in Wuhan, China, that might knock off four hundred thousand barrels a day of jet fuel demand. Right. And then <laughs> it, it snowballed from there. So, uh, yeah, we, we don't know what's going to change. We don't know if China is going to change their economic model. We don't know if, uh, you know, the spat between China and Australia that resulted in seven times more coal coming from the U.S. and 
you know, 50, 60% more coal coming from Indonesia and India and, you know, other uh, various trading partners. We don't know if that's going to get resolved tomorrow. We don't know if China's going to invade Taiwan. We don't know if, um, you know, all of India is going to be without power next week. Um, right? I mean, even, even when you read to things that say, that are, that are said in a very definitive way, like over the weekend, you know, they were saying Delhi won't have power by Tuesday. Okay. And so I'm looking at headlines today and they're saying, well, we still have a few days of inventories left. You know, there are some provinces that are now rationing power. Um, you know, China was rationing power last week um, and, and allowed some free market pricing in, uh, in coal in uh, utility markets to make sure that, uh, you know, that the, uh, the blackouts were kind of uh, uh, not as bad as they could be if, if uh, you know, if they couldn't uh, let prices flow. Calvin, so, I've got to stop you there because we only got like five minutes left. So I just want to give Omar a chance to talk and then you, we will come back for your quick sort of final thoughts. So that's okay? Yeah. Omar. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll, I'll, a couple of comments I wanted to, to mention. It, it is funny when you, when you think about the, what, what gets investors to buy because, you know, right now, if you look at tankers, it's the, the recipe is there. You know, oil demand's recovering. Uh, inventories are falling, refining margins are going through the roof, and OPEC's boosting output. Uh, we know there's not much new building supply, and then you've got an energy crisis in the near term. So you have all the little pieces are there, but each, most human beings need to see tanker rates moving to give them that nudge uh, to, to go along. So it's interesting, but that's, I think, as long as I follow shipping, that's just what is required. You need rate movement to get the masses to buy. Um, the second point I wanted to make was the uh, a lot of times when I'm asked, hey, why are why are you know cape rates spiking or why are tanker rates going to the roof? If I can answer that, that's typically not a good not a good sign that it's going to last. Um, and I think that's you know, Jay. You mentioned the you know, and, and we talked about the the floating storage. We knew rates were going to the roof, but why? Well, it was because we needed to build inventory, and at some point that was going to stop. Uh, the Costco sanctions. Well, at some point, those are going to get lifted, um, and it's just one, the 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 oil price war with with Russia and Saudi. Like all that stuff, they're all gimmicks that lead to short term trading in and out of the stocks. But when I wake up one day and I can't explain why uh, VLCCs have gone to a hundred thousand a day, that's that's when I know the capital is going to be here for a bit longer. And a point on that is. We've been for the past 10 to really since the financial crisis faced with a shrinking investor base that's looking at shipping. And it's not necessarily because it's shipping only, but it's where shipping resides within the broader uh, energy and industrials landscape. The amount of capital that's been available to those funds that have focused on that has diminished as time has gone on. And now we're flat footed as, a, as, an, as an investor community where the capital that had been diverted into other aspects is now questioning whether it should continue going in that direction or should we start funneling money into commodities? Because clearly that's where the returns are, invest in commodities. And so there should be an increased amount of capital coming our way into shipping, which should theoretically lead to much higher valuations and, uh, and more volumes and, uh, and more excitement. Okay, now guys, just yeah, I'd just like your 20 second, whatever you want. It can be pithy, it doesn't matter. 20 second soundbite of, of whatever you think is your best thought right now. Jay? Um, yeah, I guess I kind of opened with it, but right now, what we're trading, we're the most excited about is Zim Integrated Shipping, a ZIM. I have both short and longer term positions in that name. Uh, we expect they're going to do probably about $12 in earnings for 11 to 12 for Q3. Uh, they could do, uh, it's a little preliminary, but 14 to 15 for Q4. Uh, so we're docking 25 bucks earnings. They got 20 bucks of cash on the balance sheet and they trade at $45. So you pay for the company in like two quarters. Uh, pretty crazy situation. And, and that's what I'm the most excited about right now. Great. Calvin? Well, at the moment, I'm sort of heads down working on my, uh, on the new version of my platform. So uh, uh, not doing a whole lot of, of, uh, of trading right now, but we do uh, recommendations every, uh, every week on, uh, you know, just kind of how things are changing and, and what to look at. Great. Omar? All right. I'll, I'll steal this one from, uh, from Jay's comments earlier. Uh, Golar, uh, all the charters and private equity swiped all the LNG vessels out there, but what's left? Do you have Golar? That's a, it's a, 
a, a fantastic one to own here. That's great. Guys, look, thank you so much. I mean, it, it's been really good fun. And um, just, I know people have been interested. Every, literally every five minutes, the number of participants has increased on the screen, which is pretty rare. Um, a bit like the actual markets, right? It's not until things start warming up that people want to join the party. And I think we're programmed, you know, from very early age, that it's not cool to arrive first or second to the party. So Good point. But not everybody leaves early enough from the party for their own good. <laughs> Guys, thank you, Robert. So much. I appreciate thank it. You. Well, thank you thank very you. much. Great panel, extremely well attended and very spirited and insightful. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Thank you both. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you. Thanks, Nicholas.